Welcome one, welcome all to another Community Capital Live. Uh, very excited to get to uh, spend some time with everyone today. If you're tuning in and you're watching the recording of this, thank you for your time um, and thankful to all, all of everyone we got to have on the show today here. We are going to be discussing a really interesting um, and innovative funding model through uh, Poder Emma based in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and we're going to get to dig in deep on how this is um, benefiting the community and how other people can invest um, into funds like this across the country. Um, this program is a partnership between several different institutions and several different people. So I want to make sure we give a big thank you to our partner institutions, which include the Main Street Journal, which include um, Amoeba, the uh, American Independent Business Alliance, um, Neighborhood Economics, and Impact Alpha. This series we're doing, interviewing fund managers, is included in a database that we're creating to help better facilitate and educate people on community investment opportunities. And that database is going to be housed both on the Main Street Journal and also on Impact Alpha. So make sure to check out both of those publications to learn more. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel here today, and then I will introduce our guest. Um, so our panel is made up of, first and foremost, uh, I want to mention Michael Schumann, who is the author of several books on local investing, including Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, his most recent book. Um, great place to start if you're interested in local investing. Um, also, Kevin Doyle-Jones, uh, who is the co-founder of SOCAP and of Neighborhood Economics. And Neighborhood Economics has two upcoming conferences, one right here in Asheville coming up in November that you'll want to check out. Um, and then also Stephanie Swepson Twitty and Jasmine Rogers, both from the Eagle Market Streets Development Corporation. And we got to talk with them, uh, especially Stephanie, last time about her community equity fund and the ways that people can give to invest their money on a um, repeating basis. That was really fascinating and interesting. So check that out um, as well. And then today, uh, my name is Joel Skeen. I'm the host of the Mindful Marketplace show on Biz Radio US. And we are excited to get to interview Andrea Golden today. So Andrea, I want to welcome you into the conversation here. Glad to have you here today. Oh, thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, so I, I guess I'd like to start before we let the panel come into questions. I'd like to let you introduce a little bit about uh, Poder Emma and I guess tell us a little about how this all began. Um, you know, what was it that made, uh, that was the impetus for starting this community fund? Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Bolaird Emma uh, has, was founded, I believe, in about 2018. So we're a relatively uh, young organization. Um, but previous to beginning Bolaird Emma, we had been involved in many grassroots kind of initiatives and organizations in our neighborhood. And so I live in the Emma neighborhood of Buncombe County, which is in Western North Carolina. And for many years, our community organizing efforts were largely focused on immigrant rights issues. And as we saw some real um, wins from immigrant rights organizing in our neighborhood, in terms of focusing on kind of local grassroots organizing, it really kind of allowed us to open up the space to dream about what else could be possible. And um, we had been a neighborhood that at one time had been a real focal point for uh, driver's, license che driver's license checkpoints. Um, and the impact was a lot of racial profiling and discrimination. And we saw some real wins in our organizing in collaboration with our local sheriff's department. And so after that, we just kind of started to ask ourselves, like, what else could be possible? And so over the years, uh, our neighborhood created um, some really incredible cultural organizing initiatives, school-based collaborations, and it just was becoming more and more a place with a really thriving kind of community grassroots culture and infrastructure, and really a place that families, you know, like mine and my neighbors want to stay. As all of that was happening, we started to see the changing conditions of Asheville and Buncombe County around us. We're right across the Patton Avenue from West Asheville. The River Arts District was developing up on the other side of our neighborhood and we could kind of see that change was going to come. 
um, and particularly thanks to our um, you know, long-term relationships with other legacy neighborhoods in Asheville Buncombe, like East End Valley Street, Shiloh, Burton Street, Southside. They kept telling us, like, you better believe that change is going to come and you better get ready for it. Um, and so that really was kind of an uh, awakening for us. We hadn't thought about um, things like displacement and gentrification and community economic development because we had been a neighborhood that had been so isolated from the rest of Asheville Buncombe County. And so given all of that, we knew that some of us kind of had to start this focus on learning about community-led economic development. And so that was the beginning of Boulder Emma. And our idea was to focus on um, creating permanently affordable housing cooperatives, real estate cooperatives that could protect assets forever and ensure that they're um, serving community well-being and worker cooperatives for dignified work and dignified pay. And so the first things we did, they were small, they were very small scale because we didn't have access to capital. So that's about what you can do. There's only so far hustle can take you and it we went that far and then we realized we really need um, to figure out the financing piece. That was really the biggest piece that we weren't going to be able to kind of replicate and scale. Um, and so we set out to, to find the best way to create a loan fund. It took us several iterations and lots and lots of starts and stops. And, and But we were very, very fortunate to find Seed Commons, which is a national financial cooperative and CDFI, of which we became a member. And so all of our lending is through Seed Commons. So that's kind of it in a that's it in a nutshell how we got here. Yeah, that's great. I, I was familiar with Seed Commons. I talked with uh, David Lids, uh, who has a social enterprise up in uh, Boss or uh, Baltimore area, who also oh, okay. got his funding through <laughs> through them as well. So, um, yeah, I uh, you know I, I want to um, if anyone has a question, go ahead and ping me here and I'll direct it. But I guess the first thing that's coming up for me here is you mentioned the the difference that the funding is going to make in your community development activities. Um, I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on the difference that that funding can can make that you're, you know, obviously there's a reason you're going after this and you're you're going through sure. all these different models. So what is that that large difference um, that you're you're looking to make through creating the fund? Sure. Yeah. I mean, previous to being members of C Commons, like I said. Um, our vision had to match our extremely limited access to capital. So for example, the first housing cooperative that we started, this is pre-organization, pre-loan fund. It's where I live. It's a six unit mobile home park. We're really focused um, primarily and only on mobile home parks as affordable housing because it's the only affordable housing left in our neighborhood and there is an abundance of it. And so we were only able to contemplate something like a six unit park because we had to do it with just that kind of grassroots. Everybody that you know who can make you alone jump through a bazillion hoops doing strange things like walking cats. I mean, the things that you do when you don't have access to capital to negotiate someone who does have access to capital giving you that access, that is not replicable or scalable. We did it and we bought a six unit park. But as neighbors were coming to us and saying like, how could we do that? And how could we buy bigger parks? We absolutely knew that we could not do, do so without access to capital. I think on the worker co-op side, it's similar. Without um, access to working capital and startup capital, then you tend to focus on businesses that don't take a lot of capital to start up. Um, and in the long run, that may not be the smartest business choice. They may not be the businesses that are really connecting to neighborhood talent. They may not be the businesses that have a higher margin that really allow you to get to those living dignified wages. So that access to capital, both on the worker and the housing level is just, I mean, it's a game changer. At, at this point, we went, you know, before the fund, we had uh, six units cooperatively owned and permanently protected. Now we have 59. Um, and so we were able to really, really accelerate and kind of grow. Similarly, from the worker co-ops, we went from one or two businesses with two workers to now four businesses that have about 25 full-time workers with benefits. So, I mean, the change has just been mm. incredible. Yeah. I want to throw to uh, Kevin here, who has a question about the idea of kind of soft power and soft capital that you guys have discussed. Kevin, I'm, I'm curious if you can, uh, if you have... Yeah, uh, yeah, more clarity on on how you uh, what your question is there. 
Yeah, you know, um, I've seen the 2.3 million that's been lent. I've seen the growth in businesses, all the things you can see that are demonstrable proofs of your success, the number of properties and stuff. But, you know, your interrelation between your network of co-ops going from language uh, safety and uh, to property management, to bookkeeping services, to services to the co-ops, uh, it's that interdependence that I think has caused you to thrive so quickly uh, without capital, but with everybody, you know, mutually dependent uh, within that structure. That that uh, so it's it's it, it, as I look at Poder, and I've seen it, its growth over quite a bit of the time. You know, we, Jane Hatley and I were trying to come up with a solution before Seed Commons came along, and so I've I've been aware of of that need. Uh, you, you've done it through this deep relational way that is similar to what the uh, industrial commons has done in terms mm -hmm. of that interrelationship. And if you could just talk about how that, you know, soft power, social capital, uh, this is a, sure. a show that's about funds, but I think your, your cost of capital, financial capital is lower because of the value of your social capital. Can you talk about just mm -hmm. how that's caused you to succeed earlier and cheaper? Sure. Um, yeah, and just a note, actually, we probably need to update our, our website because now we are at about almost $7 million invested oh in our, our neighborhood. And we've had just significant growth in the past couple of years. Um, I do think, I mean, I, I, I don't know any other way to think other than neighborhood-based because that's how I think. So that's what I can speak to. And I think there's something really powerful to focusing really, really deeply on a small place um, and and both focusing deeply now, um, but also having a really long-term vision about changing conditions over a generation and, and, ha and thinking about 25 from years from now, where are we trying to go? So I think that the, the trusting relationships, they come both from being extremely place-based, we see each other every day. All of our kids go to the same schools. It's There's been, you know, relationships for generations, and that's true both for families who have been in Emma or for more recently arrived immigrant families whose families have known each other for generations in the countries that, that their families have come from. So there's long generational trusting relationships. Um, and we continue to really invest in those relationships. So although our primary, primarily what we're known for is the housing co-ops and the worker and the real estate, and we are very focused on it, we also have a whole community organizing and cultural organizing focus to make sure that those trusting relationships continue from generation to generation um, and continue to be at the heart of what we do. Um, and in that way, I think we're very similar to industrial commons. We work really closely together. We kind of come from that same background of popular education and participatory change um, and organizing where you live and being committed to that. Um, is, is that enough there? You're muted, Kevin. Yeah, Michael, if you could elaborate on what you see as the role of social capital in the overall capital stack that they've assembled and how it fits with the your broader experience. I'd sure love to hear your, your take on what she just said. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that uh, one of the things about social relationships is that they can lay a foundation for financial relationships that are of a much more... Um, beneficent character than what you're going to get from banks or other potential outside investors. Um, I've had a bunch of conversations this past week uh, with different communities about, you know, what are the stages that a community needs to go through in order to build up toward community investment? And there's, there's a bunch of communities out there mm -hmm. who say, we're just going to implement a fund. And maybe they have someone in the community that's prepared to write, uh, you know, a $10 million check to do it. And that's one way of doing it. 
But I think the other way of doing it is slow and steady, building up people in your network. But, and this is the other piece that I wanted to ask you about is part of the network is the not just the members of the co-op, I assume, but also outside investors. So if I'm a, so if I'm living in Asheville, North Carolina, and I want to put money into your project, what's the way I do it? Do I do it directly into the project? Do I go to seed comments or how does that work? Yeah, I wish that I could tell you more about the nuts and bolts of how it works, but it's kind of the beauty of the model that I can't tell you more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the great benefits to Seed Commons is that it is a financial cooperative. And so we contribute a lot to the cooperative and to other members around the country about what we're learning, our model, our experiences. Um, but in exchange, we have access to that those kind of like back office services and CDFI uh, capacity around raising the investment capital and raising the philanthropic funds to, to provide um, operational capacity. And we don't have to do that for ourselves. I think when we started out, because we didn't know that something like that was possible, and, we, you know, our thought was, well, if we need capital, we have to raise it. And so we had this idea, like we should, we're going to have to tell our story here, there, and everywhere and just raise that capital. And then we're going to have to create the systems to manage that capital. And then we need to understand the securities. Lot. I mean, it's, and for, for a grassroots organization like ours, who purposefully wants to stay a grassroots organization, we always want to be able to be, you know, by and for people of our neighborhood. And so we're, we wanted to build a model that we could always run ourselves. So when we were able to connect to Seed Commons, that was part of the beauty of it, is that Seed Commons provides that capacity to all of its members, access to lending capital, access to grant funding, access to uh, professional development and training. And we can collaborate by contributing our story to the whole, but we don't have to be out there raising that capital for ourselves, which for our community was the best decision. And, and I think the, the technical assistance that Seat Commons provides, I mean, just being extremely honest, when the, our first interaction with Seat Commons was we were the recipients of a loan. There was a new uh, property that we were looking to purchase, a small mobile home park. We approached at that time, they had a Southern peer called the Southern Reparation Loan Fund. We approached them for the loan. They provided the loan. And then through working us on it, they said to us, like, we think y'all could do your own lending. And we were like, us? <laughs> for us? Like, none of us come from finance. It's, it's, we don't, none of us have a background in it. We come from organizing. We come from building community infrastructure, but not finance. And so the amount of support that we received, one, just to believe in us that we could do it, and then to do very, very real things like provide a training in Excel sheet so that you know how to build financial models and provide the training on what is a financial model. And all it's, it's that combination of all of it that really allowed us to go from looking at a four unit park, which was the first loan that they provided us to right now. And we're looking at potentially developing new housing in a piece of property that could hold about 50 units. So that change is for, for our community was only possible by having access kind of to all of what Sea Commons offers. So do you see a way or a need to go outside of Seed Commons at some point? You know, if you're going to keep growing the neighborhood in the ways you, you'd like to? Yeah, I think there are definitely, um, there's potential to explore getting to a place where we may negotiate capital stacks and work with different funders. But there's also a lot of room for us as we meet potential and funders and investors to invite them to invest in the whole of Seed Commons. Because I think part of the benefit to investors when they're investing in that kind of national portfolio is they're 
their risk is very different because there's so much going on and it's not so concentrated. So there's benefit to that investor, but then there's benefit to us as well because that means that the capital is constantly moving through, it's performing, it's contributing to the whole. We have not yet hit a point at where Seed Commons has had to say to us like that investment is too big. And so we've gone from you know, the first loan that we did on our own was a $75,000 loan to kind of rehab a commercial building. Now we're looking at, you know, real estate transactions that are millions of dollars and, and we're still able to do that through C Commons. So we're really committed to continuing to build the commons because that provides access to our community, but it provides access to all of the peers. And I think we're really kind of betting on this financial cooperative model in terms of the path that we're pursuing. That's really interesting. You know, I talked to Ed Whitfield with Seed Commons about that first investment. And he said, you know, yeah. they had uh, talked to people who were ready with the capital to, to use the capital, which meant it was they were ready for it to be on their balance sheet and then start things and going. Ed said when <clears throat> the folks from Podera said we're ready for the capital, they were already at Home Depot with their pickups to pick up the lumber and the shingles. And there was a roof done that night, you know, as they say in, in uh, Hamilton, you know, immigrants, they get shit done. I mean, you know, when they meant ready, that means like, you know, we're 30 minutes away from being back, starting to work uh, in, until the job is done. So, uh, which luckily it happened, as I understand, before midnight. But that's, sure. these the way these folks have grown and the way their social capital has reduced their risk and helped them grow faster. I just have to keep focusing there because I think, we as a group of people interested in how these investment platforms work need to understand how to measure social capital. I don't know. Stephanie, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I would say um, thank you, Kevin, for um, the discussion so far. And I would say that um, you know, we have much to um, gain from looking at Poder, Emma, and Andrea and I have been traveling this path a, a really long time. I'm so um, enamored of the great work that, that they've done. They, um, uh, again, are a real model. But when we think about um, social capital, my, my first thought is, is, is SMURF. Um, it's an acronym for social, uh, uh, moral, um, hmm. I have to look at that, look at it every time because <laughs> I'll, I'll be 70 in, in August and, and nothing sticks. So, <laughs> but our, our Smurf is our, um, social capital. It's our, um, our moral, uh, capital. It's our, uh, in, um, uh, oh my goodness. I am having a time. I didn't eat until late, y'all. You just have to look up. <laughs> so, yeah. It's our financial capital. It's our relational capital. It's all of those pieces coming together to kind of um, be more than just, just the fiduciary part of what we bring to, to building um, a capital stack that really uh, can be impactful in community. And I 100% uh, think that that Poder, nobody does it better uh, because they start from community in and build it out. Um, as I was uh, have been working here in uh, Old Fort, that is the one thing that we have really uh, focused on with uh, building the um, new and emerging community uh, around trails here in Old Fort is thinking about uh, building it community out as a to development in, and uh, ha we have seen tremendous um, success and impact from, from that sort of thinking, so yeah. Stephanie, sorry, but for an old white guy, can you explain what community out and development in means? Sure. When we think about uh, community out versus development in, typically when you have um, uh what we would call an ingenious idea like outdoor rec and activity um, 
bring forward in a community and um, trail development is a vehicle to to make outdoor rec and activity um, run. Um, uh, folk would immediately run to um, seasoned and mature trail developers and say, hey, come to us and, and help us build these trails. And um, then uh, they would layer on and they would say to uh, other developers who do housing and commercial product, come and uh, stand up um, small businesses and um, other products um, without ever kind of saying to the community, hey, community, is there any of this you really want? You know, or community, if you do want this, what do you want it to look like? You know. Uh, or is there anybody in the community who's already doing any of these things um, that we can um, bring into the um, discussion to help it be a more uh, impactful, more successful um, build? And uh, so whenever um, we started our project, um, Jason McDougal, who is a partner of ours, along with the U.S. Forestry Service, we went right to the heart of um, the Old Fort Community Forum and sat at the table with the folk who, um, to uh, again, Andrea's point, who had no idea of anything about trail building, had no idea about community economic development, no idea about how to build a house or any of those things. And we asked them, what do you want? And that is how we used our Smurf to, to start to build this project. So, uh, and again, you know, we had looked at their model and could tell that that was a, a way to be successful. So, yeah. Thank you. That's beautiful, Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, that makes me think the, the method that we use um we're a popular education kind of based organization and so we use a kind of research that's called participatory action research and that is when you research kind of your own reality and so we provide neighborhood-based trainings to get neighborhood-based researchers who then go out and interview neighbors and then get trained on how do you analyze and code what came out and then everybody that participated, both researchers and community members that were interviewed, get back together um, to create action plans, to analyze and create action plans. And I think a, like a really interesting example of how that shifted our course, even on investment and on cooperative development, was we had purchased that one first commercial building. It's it's a you know about a two thousand square foot building in the kind of heart of our neighborhood. And it was housing our network of grassroots organizations and the worker-owned cooperatives. And then over the first several years, everything began to grow and we were just bursting at the seams. So we knew we need to set out and look for um, another commercial space to kind of alleviate some of that. And, and because that's such a huge endeavor, you know, we wanted to ask community, well, what else should we be looking for? You know, what does the community need? And so our participatory action researchers went out, talked to hundreds of neighborhood residents and said, the last time we talked, the neighborhood said, we need more housing cooperatives and more worker cooperatives, amongst many other things that the neighborhood said. And, but what else is it gonna take to stop gentrification and displacement? What are we not thinking of? And we were, totally surprised to hear that overwhelmingly one of the most popular answers was we need a rec center. We need a place where we can gather because we don't have like a county rec center. We don't have a library. There used to be a soccer field in the elementary school that kids could play in, but then that was redeveloped into a fabulous preschool, but it's no longer a soccer field. So there really is no gathering place. And what we heard over and over is if we want what we're building to last long haul, there has to be a place for neighbors to spend time together um, and to engage together. So we built that into our business model and it led to a nearly $3 million investment into this space that I'm sitting in now that kind of hosts all of it. It's an economic development hub and a recreational and cultural center. Um, and really looking at how to build the economic model that can support that so that we can um, 
you know, create cooperatives that are self-sustaining and that are able to pay off their investment and are not just perpetually reliant on, on grant funding. So that, that was a huge investment that we did not see coming. Had you asked us that pre the community research, we had, did not have a recreational center on our, our radar, even though we're neighborhood residents and we live here. And I think that's why it's so important to make sure to consult you know, the entire neighborhood and open it up to collective dialogue because sometimes you hear just super surprising things. So one one question I have is if someone in the neighborhood wants to create a new housing co-op or a new worker co-op and they have an idea, what are the stages that you will you know, facilitate taking the person through or a group of people sure. through to get to that end point? Good yeah, question. That's a, great, that's a great question. Our model is um, we organ all of our cooperatives are members of um, one shared cooperative. So kind of the umbrella cooperative, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. is called Elegido. And then each of the worker co-ops, uh, housing co-ops, and the real estate cooperative are members of Elegido. And so um, I think, you know, like Kevin alluded to, in our beginning, it kind of evolved organically. We knew we wanted to grow. We wanted to get into more cooperative development. And from the beginning, we knew that that would take an interpreters and translators cooperative to, because our, our community is multilingual. And so in order to do economic development, we had to have access to language access. Um, and then the second cooperative that um, within our ecosystem we started was Power Numbers Bookkeeping because we also knew that we had to have really, really good bookkeeping if we were to try to build out this model. So that's kind of where we started. Um, and then as we were getting into more worker development, we were hearing, I'm, I'm a parent, I have three kids, parents kept identifying, yeah, but access to full-time childcare is also a real barrier. There is also a lot of talent around early childhood education in our community. And so then the next worker co-op was born, Preescolar La Bugambilia. They provide uh, preschool, after school, and summer camp. Um, and then as the housing all started to grow and the way the housing grows is we're just, we are anything that comes, any mobile home park that comes on the market in our geographic footprint, we are pursuing. And we're also, you know, pursuing relationships with owners that are not yet on the market and, and building that relationship so that if and when they're ever ready to transition, they would transition ownership to their residents. And so as the housing began to grow, I think in you know, early 2020, and we had put an offer in on two mobile home parks that were going to bring 39 units into the network. That was significant growth. We knew we had to start a property management and maintenance cooperative to manage those assets that was growing beyond a self-manageable scale. And so up until now, things have kind of evolved um, as the ecosystem evolves, it's, you know, we really try to match like need and opportunity and skill all together. And um, so that it can kind of, you know, we're all working together to build this much larger thing. If someone has a, a new idea or there's a new opportunity, it's presented to the board of Elegido. And so each housing cooperative, their president serves on the board and each worker cooperative, their steward, which is, would be similar to a, you know, management or coordinator type position, their steward serves on the board. And so the Elegido board represents all of the cooperatives and they ultimately have to approve a new cooperative to join our, our network or our cooperative of cooperatives. Right. So, so that's great. It sounds like though there's a lot of education, a lot of training implicit in that. Do you do that? Yes. Do you have a framework? Is there another like school or something you've created that stands alone on this or? Yeah, we, yeah, we used to kind of look a lot more externally and realize that just since what we're building is so specific to us culturally, geographically, um, in so many ways, we, we really decided to kind of build out most of our own. So, and I think we have that in common again with industrial commons. So, who's in Burke County and Morganton. And so 
we work really closely together. We created a shared kind of regional ecosystem called Power of the Commons. And so across our two cooperative ecosystems, we train all of our stewards in coaching supervision and we provide open book management, financial management training. So we do that together across both communities. Um, but then we also run an internal uh, workforce development program and member development program where members are, are committed to quarterly training to learn everything from what's a co-op to what's a profit margin to access to scholarships to do things like become a licensed electrician. So our workforce development program is both industry focused, co-op focused and business focused. That's great. I mean, one, one thing that I see is a huge opportunity is I'm going to guess that, you know, there are hundreds of business students, uh, you know, living within 50 miles of you who might be willing to, for, you know, various projects to work with you. Um, yeah, one of our favorite tools that we use, we it was a, a student who was getting a PhD, I believe, in business development and approached us and said, like, could I do a project with you all? And we were like, yes, we need to know how to calculate what is the right amount of billable hours within, what's the billable hour goal and how do we measure it? And how does that tell us what the profit margin should be? We don't know. I do, I not only do I not come from finance, but I do not come from business. If you might, shockingly, you're probably gathering. So that was, it's such a great example of collaboration where we had this student interview our co-ops, get a sense of what they were needing, built us out this spreadsheet that now we use every week in our meeting with stewards and with co-ops. Um, th things like that are a huge boost to our capacity. Yeah, that's great. You know, I wanted to ask a little bit more in depth about the loans. I, you know, I'm, I'm really, it's really neat that I think you guys have honed in on the different cooperative needs, whether that's housing, that's, um, you know, labor, um, or that is kind of community space, uh, you know, those, those kind of places where people can come together. I am curious on the actual loans that you've been able sure. to uh, make. I'm curious, like how, how what the terms of those are, and if they're if they're able to be more favorable for the community, um, mm -hmm. or you know if if um, you know if you've and what kind of results you've seen coming out of those loans, whether it's new worker co-ops or whether it's new you know projects in general. I'm just kind of curious what examples you've already have of the lending you've been able to do and what's come out of it, how it's worked. Sure. Yeah. So see, Cummins. Um, the lending that C Cummins does is called non-extractive lending. Um, and so on the worker side, you know, what that means is the loan is to be repaid once the loan has actually in, uh, resulted in increased profit. And so that really allows the businesses to take on debt and to use it wisely and to know that they're not going to have to repay until it's done what it was intended to do. I think that that's, it's a critical piece. In the beginning, we were a cooperative, a community that was really debt adverse. And I include myself on that, which is now funny to think back on. You know, Kevin will remember back in the day, we did everything through saving circles. It was like our own money and we pull it and we see what we can do. And then we do it again and we do it again. And that was phenomenal, but it had a limit to how much we could do. And then so I think finding, getting to know non-extractive lending and to understand that debt doesn't always have to be detrimental, that it's not always setting out to always recover itself at all costs was was a game changer for us. And so that the terms of non-extractive lending are critical for a community like ours. Um, and yeah, we do all sorts of lending. You know, we might do a working capital loan if a co-op is, you know, ready to add another worker, but knows that they're going to need some time to train them before they can bring on the new clients. We might do a working capital loan. We do lines of credit, for example, um, Chispas, which is the property maintenance. They're also our contractor on our neighborhood-based home repair program. Um, and they offer home repair within the housing cooperatives as well. And so a line of credit allows them to do the work, get the materials, set people up on payment, cycle that capital through. And then, you know, obviously we do purchase loans for the real estate assets, improvement loans for the real estate assets. And we also have, I think, a particularly interesting um, 
internal fund that we call kind of our real estate risk fund. And that was actually capital that we raised on our own um, in collaboration with Dogwood Health Trust. And the intent on that is when a cooperative makes an offer on a property, like right now we're, we're in a due diligence a period on a property, we're able to pay all of those due diligence expenses from that kind of risk fund. And if the community decides it's not a good investment, that's a forgivable loan. So community can walk away from it if that's really the best choice and not end up with a bad investment. If the, and when I say community, Elegido's board of directors, if, if the board of directors says this is a good investment, we just bundle all of that back into the purchase loan so that it recycles through the fund and can be replenished over and over. And we have cycled through that money now over and over and over again. And that was a, a really phenomenal creative lending product that, you know, Dogwood helped us create. Is, is that huh. is that the kind of information you're curious about about the loans or is there something else? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I guess too, when I'm thinking about that neighborhood, um, you know, are there are there any things that you've seen, any businesses that you've uh, that have you know kind of are any success stories that have really stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, I think on the worker side, all of the businesses are a success story. You know, we, we've been able to become members of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. So workers in our ecosystem are getting benefits for the first time ever in life. And that's, a, I mean, that is just a huge shift as a worker. And um, I think it's also been really interesting to see several generations come through the cooperatives. We have people of my generation and my children's generation now working within the cooperatives, getting trained in our workforce development program. That was our hope. That was our dream is that this would become intergenerational, but now we're seeing it happen, which is also uh, very, very exciting. And I think it's always um, really inspiring when we're able to match workers and housing you know so there are some families who many of their family members work within either within one of the worker cooperatives or within one of the grassroots projects live in the housing cooperatives um, and that just completely changes your quality of life and I can that's true for my family so I can speak to it personally it's it's just changed everything for us after paying rent for uh, 20 something years in Asheville as a single parent. I did the math once. It's terrifying and absurd the amount of money that I paid and never got back to knowing that now I've built this this equity for my children and within our housing cooperative. And that's true for myself and for so many other people in our community. And I think something that's, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, well, that's obviously lowered your level of anxiety and lowered the collective feeling of being safe that your kids have and, and the neighborhood has, have you done any quantification of the social determinants of health impact of that security on how healthier people are? Yeah, we're actually, we, we are kind of in the middle of a long-term study that we're doing in collaboration with the industrial commons that looks at both it from the inside and from the outside, and we'll be uh, publishing a paper on that. The way you've created value on so many different dimensions to the Smurf thing, I mean, the way you've enhanced health, reduced risk, kids can sleep easier at night, kids can focus better on their classes or playing or causing trouble, whichever they want to do, <clears throat> but they, they, they're they less afraid, you know, and so I think, you know, kids without being afraid that the light bill won't be paid are, are kids who, who who do better. Yeah, I think for a long time when people would ask us, like, what's your focus on health? And I know the social determinants of health are very broad, but health specifically. And we kind of grappled with that. And then recently, actually, um, this, this research that we're doing, we call kind of our outside researchers the ecologists. So one of our ecologists who's studying our ecosystem reflected this back to us, and it was... You know, I hadn't seen it like that before, but once it was named, it was so clear, which is that increase in your quality of life very much has to do with your health. And I, I think, you know, on a personal level, like I'm, I'm a recent cancer survivor and the quality of life that I had through my cancer treatment and both in my work and my home and for my children, 
had we not been a part of this ecosystem, it would have been a completely different story. And I was lucky to beat my cancer. I have a neighbor who was also a member of one of our housing cooperatives. We were going through cancer treatment together. He's a dear friend. I try to name his name every chance I get so that he'll always be remembered. Uh, Reggie, but he was not as fortunate as cancer was terminal. And even though we couldn't change the outcome of his terminal cancer, his quality of life to move into a unit that had air conditioning, if, if you've ever been through chemo, to live in substandard housing while you're going through chemo is an absolute nightmare. And so to increase both his housing quality of life and to be within a neighborhood where neighbors are checking in every day and that dignity around sickness and death and dying I don't know how you measure that, but it was when someone reflected that back to us, it was just, it took my breath away because it's it's really, really real and it doesn't show up in the numbers, but it, it just changes your life completely. Andrea, one of the things that impresses me is that you're stepping in doing stuff that, that one usually expects the local government or county government to do. Um, and you're doing it better. And I wonder if you've been able to persuade these, you know, overseeing jurisdictions to contribute, or maybe there's some formula like you achieve X goal and then yeah. they contribute Y amount of money because you've saved them money. Sure. You know, that's a, we've never framed it like that before. So I'm going to work on crunching those numbers and talking about what we've saved. But we do have a very um, close relationship with parts of our local government. Um, our last neighborhood plan that we um, published in 2023 is actually a roadmap that we're asking local governments to kind of follow accompany us on. It has public policy recommendations that um, our community believes that if, if local government can collaborate with us in these ways, it will allow us to continue and accelerate uh, the community development work that we do. And so, you know, we're very mindful about being active with local government as a thought partner. I think for many years, you know, coming out of traditional organizing, sometimes that relationship can be like something negative happens and the community responds and that's critical it's important it's also exhausting and hard to sustain over a lifetime speaking for myself so i think we were really intentional as we were starting poder Emma to approach you know the city of Asheville, buncombe county we're increasingly talking you know with the town of woodfin who their staff is also doing it really, really creative thinking. And so if we can partner the staff's creative thinking with our community's creative thinking and and really be partners, we think we can come up with innovative uh, policy-based strategies. And so we have a monthly neighborhood council that meets and is focused on our relationship with local government and in our ability to build positive public policy. Yeah, that's great. Um, sounds like you should be local government. <laughs> yeah seriously oh, um i think we're we're sitting right where we need to be sitting. <laughs> yeah right yeah um oh, just, I'm curious... actually one one, one yeah. other quick question so you haven't said what the scale of the neighborhood is like how many sure. people live there and you know who do you see is in inside the group that you are organizing yeah, Emma itself is, and I really should know this number by heart, but it's a couple thousand households. So it's a small okay. neighborhood, mm -hmm. although we have extended our what we call our service area to include about five miles out into the Irwin School District and the town of Woodfin. So that then multiplies it. Um, and that really was a result of because gentrification and displacement are already happening, we are already seeing families being pushed out a bit further into the county. And so we wanted to kind of expand our, our service area, but we really are mainly focused on a neighborhood that's just a couple thousand households. And we get asked a lot, like, but would y'all come do it here or there? And, you know, we just... One, we don't have the capacity, but two, like we are of the belief of our role is to share out any lessons learned, the good, the bad, the ugly, so that other people can do what they are called to do in the places that they live. And that that's really, for us, the most powerful model. 
Yeah, and that's yeah. one of the one of the principles of co-op development is helping other co-ops get off the ground. Sorry, Joel, back to you. Yeah. No, this is uh, uh David Sharp. Oh, David, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Andrea, uh, great great to to hear from you. Um you know, we've kind of done those this couple of convenings up in Asheville and you you've been front and center on on some of the research that we did with the reinvestment fund. So I, I want to make sure that I plan to to get up there and actually spend some time with you guys specifically. Oh, but that would be my, great. Yeah, but my question to you though is um um like we've done a lot of work where you know we've really worked hard to build trust with um the community and some of the borrowers, but then you know uh we've had a couple instances where where that that trust and that um it, it hadn't gone both ways, if you will. And so mm -hmm. what do you do in a scenario when you're really close, you know, you're quote unquote, like you mentioned, you're going to the same schools, the kids are going to the same schools and you have to default on a borrower and it's not a pleasant situation. How do you go about mitigating that? Or like, like, I'm sure, I'm sure that's a touchy situation. It works. It works well when it works. Yeah. But if you yeah. have challenges, then it could be very kind of interesting. I could be your next door neighbor that you're sitting in a defaulting on if it's like, you know, oh, in the yes. community. So could you just touch on anything along those lines? Yes. You speak as if you might live in my neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very, very real. We're real people in the real world. And um, I'm trying to think of the, the, the best way to answer this. I mean, I think one, the terms of the lending are really important because I, like I work as the loan officer for Poder Emma. If a co-op is unable to make a loan payment, but we've been in communication about it and we're planning a pivot, the loan is not in default. And so I have not yet been put in the situation and we have almost a dozen loans out, almost $7 million. I have not been put in a situation where as a lender, I have to declare a loan in default because the C Commons model allows me to say, hey, I foresee that next quarter this business might hit a bump. We're working on this pivot. We're working on this change. We're going to have to put the payments on pause. We're going to have to renegotiate the length of the loan. That has been sufficient. When we talk about the cooperative's health, um, I think that's a real benefit to non-extractive lending. That is not to say that on the individual member level, there haven't been cases where the cooperatives have had to make the very real decision to terminate membership. Um, and so we also are really invested in, you know, transformative justice, mediation, pivots, improvement plans, but we are also, you know, and that's on the support side of our commitment to the coaching supervision model, but we also believe in accountability and our accountability to each other is very detailed at the practice level, at the policy level, at the governing level, so that cooperatives can make the clear and the difficult decision. And I think with that framework of we're not just building this for ourselves, we're building this for future generations, sometimes we're called to make uh, difficult decisions. However, it usually ends up it has not come to the level of affecting the cooperative's um, ability to repay the loan because the terms are so flexible. We're able to pivot. We're able to work through the hard thing that's going on, and then we're able to get the cooperative back on track. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what you guys are doing is not only um, a really excellent, like, you know, like Michael said, you know, kind of stepping up in a community that needs it where others are not like the government or like other businesses. Um, but it also seems like it's a really great uh, inspiration for other communities that are facing those same challenges of gentrification, of increased housing prices, of all the things that are going on. I guess if, if someone was listening to this today and said, Hey, like I'm, I'm interested in kind of organizing my community. Uh, what, what, what piece of advice, I guess we can go out on this. What, what piece of advice would you have for those, those folks? Usually kind of off the cuff, what I say is like, just love where you live and stay there and just do oh. it. The one thing will lead to the next. And I, and I really mean that it's just kind of like, it might take you 10 or 20 years, but I promise that you will get there if you love it deeply enough. I, I really believe that. 
at the same time, we have created in collaboration with Industrial Commons, something that we call the Accelerating Common Economies Institute, where communities can visit us from around the country, spend some time with us, do tours, and kind of work on accelerating their own vision. So we are trying to be um, to find good ways to kind of support people in accelerating their visions. I think, though, that sometimes it just does take it's the work of a lifetime. I, I really believe that. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's the work of, of lots of lifetimes, you know, really, if we zoom out, you know, it, yeah. it doesn't just end with us. That's for sure. Um, I'm reminded that's of what Wendell Berry says, you know, that it all turns on affection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the, like. the time that we've got for today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you, Andrea, so much for your time and for enlightening us today. Thanks to our panel, Michael Schumann, Stephanie Swepson Twitty, Kevin Doyle Jones, Jasmine Rogers. Um, I'm Joel Skeen from the Mindful Marketplace. You can follow this show on Mindful Marketplace Show on YouTube and check out the database um, and the archive of these episodes there, as well as on the Main Street Journal, Impact Alpha, and MindfulMarketplaceShow.com. All right, everyone out there, take care of yourselves and take care of someone else. Thank you so much.